In this video lecture, we're going to introduce the state space or state variable representation of a continuous time LTI system. So uh, what I have here uh, written out is a third order differential equation in Y. I've left off the dependent or the independent variable T, but these are functions of time. So we have Y triple dot plus some coefficient B2, Y double dot plus B1, Y dot plus B O, Y is equal to, and then on the right we have the driving function U. A2 U double dot plus A1 U dot plus A0 U. So we could draw in general a function a signal U of T that enters our LTI system, which could be represented in this case by our linear differential equation. Uh, we could have put h of t, h of s, different things like that as well. Uh, and the output is y of t. Okay. And the first thing we're going to do before we develop the state space representation is we're going to learn how to uh, represent this uh, differential equation as, uh, as a signal block diagram. And so I have uh, purposely chosen the coefficients as I have. You notice there's a coefficient of 1 out here. That's not, I didn't, you know, it's not trickery here. We could have put B3 there, and um, and then we could have left B0 to B1, or we could leave A0 to B1. The point is, uh, one of these coefficients can be, le can be 1, um, since the whole equation can be normalized, right, such that one of those coefficients has a value of 1, and in this case, it's going to be convenient to normalize this highest power of the of y um, to uh, to be one. Now, one of the things is that when you draw a block diagram, so let's do a signal block diagram. You want to use integrator blocks and not derivative blocks, and that'll become apparent later. So the building blocks are as follows we'll have an integrator block all right, such that if you have uh, y coming out then you had y dot going in, right? The, uh, the integral, the antiderivative of the derivative y is y. We'll have uh, summing blocks where we can have more one or more inputs with a plus or minus sign, you know, to, to indicate whether it's addition or subtraction one output, and we'll have scaling blocks, or we might have some constant k. All right, Those are the elements that we're going to use. Now, uh, instead of taking a general case, like nth order or whatnot, we're going to work with this third order, but all of this will, uh, will apply to the more general uh, case, including higher order systems. So, the trick to being able to draw a block diagram for that involves only integrals for this differential is you need to express this is key express the highest derivative of y in terms of all other derivatives of y. Okay, of y and u of t terms. Okay, so this is pretty important. So I'll put a box around it. If you don't do this, you're going to have a hard time finding way, your way to an all integral signal block diagram. So here we go. We have y triple dot is equal to a2 u double dot plus a1 u dot plus a0 u minus b2 y double dot minus b1 y dot minus b sub o y. Okay? And this is going to be our equation that we use for constructing our block diagram. So I'm going to start 
what I notice is that y triple dot is the sum of many terms. So let me draw a sum here, which you can put a plus or a sigma, Greek sub sigma sign in there. And what comes out is going to be y triple dot. Now if I have y triple dot, I see that I have, uh, in this equation, I have y double dot, y dot, and y. So how do I get any of those from y triple dot? Well, if I take the integral, I'll get y double dot. And then if I take the integral again, I'll get y dot. And now one last time, take the integral, and I get y. Okay, notice it's no accident that there are three integrals, and this is a third order differential equation. So let's think of, look at these uh, terms in, in the derivatives of y. I have minus b2y double dot. Well, I have y double dot here, so how about if I just put in one of my scaling blocks, feed y double dot to it, and then the output of that will go back and subtract from the sum. We can do the same with b1 and the same for b0. Okay. It's kind of an ugly feedback path there, but... Minus. Okay, all of these are minuses. All right. Now, what we have yet to uh, to apply are these here. Okay. It would appear at this point that we need derivative terms. Like, for instance, we need a, um, let's see, we would have a0. Let me put another summing block here. We would have the derivative, let's see, a1 a2, all of these would feed in, and they'd all add, right? But we would have, let's see, the derivative, if I do a d for derivative, for a1, and then we need another derivative for a2, right? Now that, that would be technically correct, but we don't want to use any derivatives. So I'm going to delete this, or I'm going to just cross it out, and we'll no derivatives. Okay, so how are we going to do this? So we got to use some trickery. Let me copy this back. Um, oops, yeah, let me get a copy of that. So we're ready because we're going to use it again here in a minute. Okay. So I've got to use some general notation here for a differential equation. Um, let d equal our, our d dt. All right. Then we can write our differential this our differential equation this way. We can write b we can write d cubed, that's the third derivative, plus b2 d squared plus b1 d plus b sub o. We'll say all of that operates on y of t. And this is equal to, let me bring this over here. Okay, this is equal to, what did we say? a2. a2 d squared plus a1 d plus a0, all of that operating on u of t, okay? This is just some short form for our differential equation. This whole thing here we're going to call L. It's this operator that operates on y of t. And on the right here we're going to call this LD. D for like driving, because it's the driving operator. It operates on the driving function u of t. Okay. Now let's define 
and a uh, let's define a y hat of t such that the following is true y of t is equal to l d operating on y hat of t all right and we'll see you'll see where we're going here in a minute now plug in plug we're going to plug that y of t into our uh, differential equation so we'll have l operating on ld operating on y hat of t equal to ld operating on u of t okay now it turns out that these are commutative. I'm going to have to put this down to the next page here. Okay, these are commutative. Okay, after all, they're just each individually awaited sum of uh, derivatives. And so you can operate on y hat with L first and then LD or vice versa, and it will be the same. So let's flip these two. We'll have LD operating on the quantity L operating on y hat of t and this is equal to LD operating on u of t okay which is satisfied when L operating on y of t is equal to u of t. And lo and behold what we've done is we've gotten rid of L d for the time being. We have a system that does not involve a driving operator. But of course it's the output is no longer y, it's y hat. So we need to relate y hat y to y hat, which we defined y hat um, up here, right, as being related to y according to this expression. So we, we have an expression for y. It's just LD operating on y hat. Okay, so let's use this result and see if we can make some progress on how we draw our block diagram and avoid any different derivative terms. I'm going to make this claim. I can come along here and um, just put hats on everything. Okay? And then we'll call this U of T. And this system here is equivalent to, or is, the representation, block diagram rec representation for L operating on Y hat of T equal to U of T. Okay? And now I'm very close to being able to write the original system. Let me make a copy of this. Bring it down. Okay. So now we have LD. What we need is we have Y is equal to LD operating on Y hat which is, in our case, LD is A2 D squared plus A1 D plus A naught operating on Y hat of T. Right? And what is that? We can say it's A2 Y hat double dot plus A1 Y hat dot plus A naught Y hat. And conveniently, we have signals y hat double dot, y hat dot, and y hat. Right? They're right here. We already have those available. So all we need to do is a weighted sum of those. So here's how we do it. We'll take y, scale it by a naught, go into a summer here. This is going to be y of t. Oops. OK. 
Okay, we'll have A1 and we'll have A2. And A1 comes from white hat dot and A2 is fed with y hat double dot. And here is our state variable, or no, no, we haven't defined state variable. This is just our block diagram representation of our original system. Let me go back up. Let's grab it here and put it down there. Okay, so these are equivalent. Okay, so we could expand this to uh, an nth order instead of third order. This we could just keep going. Now, um, at this point, we're ready to define our state variable representation. So what we're going to do first, we have to talk a little bit about states. Okay, states. What do we mean by the state of a system? So it's helpful to think about um, physical system, so whether it was uh, mechanical or electrical, think about the things about a mechanical system, mechan electrical system, fluid system, whatnot, that actually um, represent energy. So a mechanical system, if you had a mass that was in motion, it has potential, as kinetic energy, right? One half mv squared. Okay, so let's think about some states here. States of a system. Okay. So think energy such as one half m v squared or one half k x squared, right? Or you could write it um, you could write this as yeah that's that's gonna it was electrical, you would say one half C V squared, right? Capacitor, or one half L I squared for an inductor. There is no energy storage for a resistor, right? Or for some viscous damper that doesn't exist. Okay, so these would be the the states, um, or these would be tied to some states. What is the actual state? So for a mass, the state. We'll say the energy is here. The state would be the velocity, right? And here it would be the position. Here it would be the voltage. And here the current. And you could have alternative um, variables here as well. For instance, instead of having the position, since Hooke's Law says that F equals KX, you could also have force. Right? And similarly for a capacitor, since voltage is equal to um, 1 over capacitance times charge, Q, you could also have charge right because these are proportional so it could be position or force voltage or charge You've got current um, and you could also hear this might not be as familiar but you could have flux linkage okay so that's how that's a way to think about the states of a system and uh, it turns out that when you uh, take such a system, say a mechanical system, and you take its differential equation and you represent it as a block diagram, as so here, all of the outputs of these integrators, okay, right here, right here, and right here, will all be tied to one of these energy states. Okay, so for instance, think about a capacitor. Okay, capacitor, it's got a voltage, VC, a current, IC. Now we would say the voltage is equal to 1 over C, the integral 
of the current. Right? So I could represent that as 1 over C block and then an integral. What comes out is voltage and what goes in here is IC. And if this capacitor was tied to some node and you had KCL, like currents going in, currents going out, then you would probably have a summing junction here with some currents adding and subtracting, forming whatever is the net current that goes through that cap. Similarly, if we have a mass, right, and it has some velocity, and we apply some force to it, we would say F is equal to M times the acceleration, or dV dt. This is analogous to the cap, saying that IC is equal to C dVc dt. Well, we can put that in integral form, and we'd say the velocity is equal to 1 over the mass integral of the force applied. So once again, we would have this block diagram representation of 1 over m scalar, force coming in here, feeding an integral block, and what's coming out is the velocity of the mass. right? And that output, that integral output, is the state of the system. So what we want to do when we consider this state variable representation, we're going to focus, we're going to kind of zoom in on describing the system in terms, terms of its state. And that's kind of the paradigm shift with, in comparison to when you just take a, a single differential equation, like in this case a third order differential equation. The focus there is on the output. So the differential equation is written in terms of the output, um, in this case one output. But in the state variable representation, the focus is on writing differential equations in terms of the states. In fact, there will be a differential equation, a first order differential equation for each state. And so that's what we're heading, for, heading toward. In this case, since it's third order, what we'll end up having is three first order differential equations. And it will be an equivalent representation to the single third order differential equation that you see here. So here's how we go about it. I'm going to make a copy of this because we're going to reuse it. And we'll put it down here. Okay, now what we're going to do, I'm going to use a different color. We'll call this output here x1. We'll use x, use x's for system states. Okay, so that'll be x1. What goes in here then is x1 dot, right? We're going to call the output of the second integral block x2 and x3 for this one. Okay, and we can write the following expressions. We can say x1 dot is equal to x2, right? Because these are actually the same signal. X 2 dot is equal to x3, right? This would be x2 dot, because x come, x2 comes out, so x2 dot must go in. And then x3 dot is actually right here. x3 dot right there, okay? And what is it equal to? It is equal to minus b2 x3. Actually, let me start this over. It'll be minus, and I, I think the red is too much. Let me go to uh, yellow here. Okay, so we'll have minus b0 x1. That's this path here. Minus b1 x2. Here's x2 minus b two x three right here and then the last term is plus u of t 
Okay. Now lastly, we would write that the output y of t then is simply, well, I'm sorry, y, let's, let's do y hat. y hat of t is equal to x1, right? But we're not really interested in y hat ultimately, right? We're interested in y. And notice that um, we can write y as a weighted sum of the variable of the states of the system. Okay, let me make a little room here. So we'll have y of t is going to be equal to a0 x1 plus a1 x2 plus a3 x3. And now we're going to put this into a matrix form. We will have a vector x dot, which will be made up of x1 dot, x2 dot, x3 dot. I'll use a line underneath x to indicate it as a vector. And this will be equal to a matrix, which we will fill out shortly. Move this over a bit. Times the vector x, x1, x2, x3, plus another vector times u of t. Now let's fill that out x1 dot is equal to x2, so that means we're going to have a 0, a 1, and a 0 here. And then a 0 over here, it doesn't have u in it. x2 dot is equal to x3, so we'll have a 0, a 0, and a 1. And finally, x3 dot is minus b sub 0, x1, minus b sub 1, x2, minus b sub 2, x3, plus 1 times u of t. All right. This is written and or given the terms x dot is equal to a matrix A times x plus a matrix B times u. And I'm going to put u as a vector because in general we could have more than one input. Okay, in fact, uh, this is a, x is an n by 1 vector, a is an n by n matrix, and x is an n by 1 matrix, or vector. b is an n by m matrix where m is the number of inputs, okay, and u is an m by 1 all right, so there are m inputs in general. In our case, of course, there's just one. Now we can write an expression for the output. Let me move this over, make a little room. Okay, so for the output, what we have is we can write y of t is equal to, and then we will have a, a row vector, or row matrix, times our x vector, x1, x2, x3, plus a quantity times u of t. Now what we have from our expression here is we have a0 times x1, a1 times x2, a2 times x. Let's see, I have an error there. A0. Um, yeah, I guess I need a... This is an A2 here, right? Let me double check. Yes, there is no A3. Okay, and y does not depend on u, so it's a zero. In general, 
this is written as y vector, we could have multiple outputs, is equal to a matrix C times x of t plus a matrix D times vector u, right? Where C is going to be a, well, y is a p by 1, all right? Because there are p outputs in general. C is going to be a p by n. X is an n by 1. And D is going to be a p by m, right? Remember where m is the number of inputs, okay? So here is our state variable representation. This is the general form right here. And we have applied this to a third order system. Now a couple comments on this. Notice that, change colors here, notice A only contains coefficients of L. Okay? That's significant. So, if you're considering or wondering what the dynamics of the system are, will it oscillate? Does it have a natural, underdamped, uh, resonant mode? All of that information is contained in the matrix A. It is not contained in C or D or B. Of course, when you talk about the natural response, you turn the inputs off, so you would be zero anyway. So you would end up having x dot is equal to ax. And the dynamics, the natural response of the system will be contained and described completely within A. If you change what the output is, okay, what will change is or like where you pull the output from uh, from the system, C and D will change, but it will not change the basic characteristics of the system. Okay, let's finish up this uh, topic by actually working an example. In this example, we have an electric circuit that has two inputs, a current source I1 and a current source I2, and there are uh, there's an output Y that is defined as the uh, the resist the voltage across the resistor. R1. I'm going to call that Y1 because I'm also interested in another um, output and I'm going to call that the current right here. I'm going to call it Y2. Okay, now clearly that's a current, but just to make this clear, um, we'll call it Y2 and we'll also, okay, so it's IC1 and in parentheses here, this is V. R1. All right, so we need to create a state variable representation. Now, how do you start doing that with a physical system? Well, this goes back to the idea of a state being tied to energy storage. So look at this circuit and think, where is energy stored? We have two capacitors, an inductor and a resistor. The two current sources are input to the si inputs to the system, so they're not, they're not part of the system. They'll be like our U1, U2 terms. Capacitors, they store energy. Inductors store energy. So we have three states. Three energy states. Energy storage, I'll say three energy storage elements. Okay. We have C1, C2, and L. And what I like about the state variable representation is that you once you identify those states, you just start writing a first order differential equation for each of those states. Let me show you how that works. So if you recall for a capacitor, we have C1 and we have some current I1, IC1, and a voltage VC1. Okay? And or maybe I'll yeah, we'll do it that way. And we'll write IC1 is equal to C1 DVC1 DT, right? 
So let me rewrite that. We can rewrite that as VC1 dot is equal to 1 over C1 IC1. Now notice we've just taken the derivative of one of our states. All right, that's an x dot term, like x1 dot. Now what we're going to need to do is express that vc1 dot in terms of all of the other states in the system. So let's, uh, before we do that, let's go ahead and, and write, um, or start off the other two elements. We'll have c2, I'll say ic2 is equal to c2 dvc2 dt, and therefore we have vc2 dot is equal to 1 over c2 IC2. And finally we have our inductor L with the current IL and a voltage VL. So we can write uh, V equals L di dt, right? VL is equal to L dil dt. Or we can write, um, yeah, actually that works really nice. We'll have IL Sorry, I confused myself for a second. 1 over L VL. Okay. Let's go back to VC1 dot. We'll now try to express that in terms of the other states and our inputs. So IC1. What is IC1? If we do KCL at this node here, we will be able to write what, uh, what IC1 is. It's nothing but I2 plus IL. And what we need to make sure is that the quantities that we put in here are either a state variable or they're one of the inputs. Well, I2 is one of the inputs and IL is one of the states. All right, so we're good with that. Then we're going to do KCL over here for finding IC2. And we'll have 1 over C2 times, and here we have I1, also an input, minus IL. Again, we're able to write VC2 dot in terms of inputs and states. Lastly, we have the voltage VL that we need to solve for. In this case, we are going to do a KVL. Okay? So we'll say 1 over L times, and now the voltage VL is like this, right? It has to be that way because we've labeled the current to the right, so passive sign convention says that's what VL is. What is VL? VL is VC2 minus VC1 minus the voltage drop across the resistor, which is ILR1. So it's going to be VC2 minus R1 IL minus VC1. And notice those are all state variables. Now let's write what our outputs are. So we have Y1, Y1 of T, which is equal to VR1 of T is equal to, it's just the resistance times the current IL, one of our state variables. And Y2 of T is IC2. And what is it? No, I'm sorry. Is that what I said it was? No, IC1. IC1. All right. IC1. And it's going to be by KCL. It's IL plus I2. IL plus I2. Now we have everything we need to write our state variable representation. So let's take this and we can write VC1 dot VC2 dot and there's no particular order that you need to write these in. They would be correct and in any order although of course your matrix A would look rearranged for mine if you used a different order. Okay, VC1, VC2, IL. And plus, now this is, we've got two inputs now, right? 
we have I1 and we have I2. Alright, so in this case we have M is equal to 2. Alright, two inputs. And now we got to fill this in. VC1 dot is equal to 1 over C of I2. Okay, 1 over C2 of I2. Oops, 1 over C1 of I2 plus 1 over C1 of IL. There we go. VC2 dot is 1 over C2 of I1 minus 1 over C2 of IL. And then IL dot is equal to minus 1 over LVC1 plus 1 over LVC2 and minus R1 over L IL and there's no direct connection to the currents okay so this is the matrix A this is the matrix B and now we have to write our output matrix equation we'll have VR1 and IC1 which of course would be equal to Y1 and Y2 as we've defined them equal to and now we're going to have our C matrix which will be equal to it'll be a 2 by 3 right, because we have VC1 VC2 and IL plus and here we have a 2 by 2 times I1 I2 vector okay now let's fill it out so this is a 2 by 2. So we have um, R1 IL, so this is going to be 0, 0, R1, and nothing over here in the D matrix. And the second one is IL plus I2. And there you go. We have this is our C matrix, and this is our D matrix. So we have just placed this system into a state variable representation. Now we don't know how to solve this yet, but uh, that's okay. The main point is that we can convert or take a physical system, find, identify the states, write a first order differential equation for each of those states and put it in a state variable format. Now notice this approach did not follow the conventional approach of trying to write one third order differential equation uh, in terms of one of our outputs. Right? That's what we would have done alternatively and actually I would argue that would even that could be more work than what we've done here. There's no substituting trying to eliminate a variable and you know in the end being able to write uh, a, a third order in terms of only IL or only VC2 or only VC1, right? So th this is, there's no trippings here. You're not going to get fouled up in um, writing these equations because it's always built around each of the states. The key is that you identify the states. And they're not hard to, d to identify because wherever there's an element that can store energy, that's where you have a state. Okay, in the next video, we will look at solutions to the state variable equations, beginning with the homogeneous solution. And then we'll look at the particular solution. After looking at those two solution forms, we'll then tackle the task of how do we actually compute it. So we'll find some expressions for the homogeneous and particular solution, but it won't be easily computable because we're going to encounter what's called functions of a matrix and um, we'll need to be clever as to how we can compute those in a 
an efficient manner. It turns out that what's really useful about the state variable representation is that if you ever run some kind of a computer simulation, say you've done some SPICE circuit simulation, or you're simulating uh, some dynamics um, on, on some uh, simulation package that's added to your 3D CAD, like uh, in SOLIDWORKS or somewhere else, what's actually happening is that the computer program has actually described um, the system in terms of the state variable representation. And this is, this is the set of equation that it solves. But it has to be very efficient at how it can compute the solution over time and avoid doing really high order you know matrix products and so forth so we'll spend some time looking at least one method that is used for being able to efficiently calculate uh, the solution so that's what's coming up